Uh, my message this morning is called Moving Past Our Limitations. I um, reflected on a, a story I heard recently. Um, I was in Hawaii in October and I spoke to a lady in Hawaii and she, she does these tours. Um, she, these veterans come from all over America uh, and they were all involved in the Second World War and uh, they come to Pearl Harbor. They come there to sort of make the pilgrimage almost to, to sort of not forget what happened. And, um, and she told me a story. We spent a day with her and she told me a story of a guy by the name of, um, I don't know his surname, but they called him No Shot Jim. No Shot Jim. No Shot Jim was a young man who really wanted to be in the military. He really wanted to be in the Air Force, be in the military. And um, so he signed up uh, even before the war began, even before Pearl Harbor was, was hit. And um, as he went through his training, um, they discovered Jim has a problem. No matter what rifle you give him, Jim can't hit the side of a barn with a shotgun. Jim is not a good shot. And so he got the nickname No Shot Jim. And uh, they ended up putting him in jobs where he was just doing cleaning and, and, and maintenance and stuff like that around the airfield because what else would you give John Jim to do? And um, on one morning, out of nowhere, Pearl Harbor was attacked. Nobody expected it. Nobody knew it was coming. Completely out of nowhere. And in that chaos, in the midst of all of that stuff going on, some people ran and hid for cover. Some people got shot and got injured. Some people were confused and all over the place. In that moment, Jim saw a rifle, grabbed a hold of it, and just started shooting at planes. That day, Jim shot down one plane. Not 10, not 20, just, just one plane. But from that day on, he was never called No Shot Jim again. What's the point of the story? The point of the story is that we can so easily be boxed in. And some of the circumstances, some of the things around us can become a definition, can come, become something that defines us, and that definition may not always be who you really are. On that day, the question wasn't, what can Jim do? Because Jim knew he could do something because he wasn't going to do nothing. He didn't know if it was going to work, but he just did what he could. You know, that's why... In, in some way, I said earlier, what, what I love about reading Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is one of the first chapters, first books I ever read in the Bible since getting saved. I've meditated and read it multitudes of times since then. And it's just been a really strong uh, scripture for me through all the years because it's a list of people that did what they couldn't do. It's a list of people that did stuff that was impossible, and yet they did it. And, and so often when I, when I look at that, I think, God, you are so amazing. Yeah, you have in this book a man by the name of Enoch who, who just loved you so much that even though the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die and then you can go to heaven, this man loved you so much he walked straight into heaven. In this book, there's a man by the name of Noah with no building experience, no, 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 never built a boat before, and builds a boat that doesn't just save two of every animal, but his entire household. He couldn't do it, but he did. You have a man by the name of Abraham who, who left everything, his father's house and everything that meant to go to a place that he didn't know to birth a nation that he couldn't even imagine. You have a woman by the name of Sarah who has a baby at the age of 90. And so the list keeps going on and on. You get Moses 
who had to put aside his bad past and the mistakes he had made and what would have disqualified him and made him no good and see a man who God rose up to be the deliverer of a nation. You get a man by the name of Gideon who was so insecure and so full of insecurities that, that he couldn't even come out from behind the barn, but, uh, come behind the instruments or where he was hiding. He couldn't even come out, but God used him and 300 men to defeat an army. You got a man by the name of David who picked up a stone and a sling and slayed a giant. Even to this day, can you imagine? A lot of people who did what they didn't think they could do. Jesus said in John 14, 12, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do. What did Jesus do? Some pretty amazing stuff, didn't he? Jesus, Jesus was able to do stuff that today you would think, this is not real. This cannot happen. And yet Jesus says that through me, you can do these and greater things. And I often, when I think about this scripture, I like reading it with Philippians 4.19. Because Philippians 4.19 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now think about it this way. We think I can do greater things than Jesus. But what it actually says is, I can do greater things because Christ now lives within me. I'm doing it through him. And therefore, all things are possible. So here's my point. We talk about moving past limitations. We talk about uh, what, what would it look like to do something different with, it, with your life. You've got to understand that you cannot do whatever you want in your natural. But in Christ, you're able to act supernaturally. There are things available to you through Christ that you cannot do in the natural. Can I add this to you? God will never ask you to do something that you cannot do. If you get an unction in your life and in your heart from God, He is never going to ask you something that's not possible. That shakes some, some cages because God says to many people things, and then the first thing we say is, I can't do that. You can through Christ. What are your limitations? What are our limitations? Where do limitations come from? What is it that limits us? People will say something like, you know, Nico, I, I, I just can't run. It's, it's not in me to run. But I promise you if a, a big black dog, angry big black dog, comes out from behind a fence, uh, you may not run, but you'll move a lot quicker than you moved before. You may say, oh, you know, I don't run. It's, it's undignified to run. It's, we don't do that in our culture. We, we do not do that. It's, it's not good uh, uh, etiquette or a good way to do stuff. But then you see your long lost son come down the road and your heart's been yearning to see him like the prodigal's father. And he breaks with custom and pulls up his robe and runs down the road. There are some things you will run for. You say, well, there's no way I, I can do that. It's too heavy. It's too much. And then you go to the gym day after day, and, and little bit by little bit, eventually you, you can do it. Am I right, James? Little bit by little bit. Has there been things in your life that you once said, I can never do that. It's impossible for me. It's too hard, and yet today you're doing it. Why is that? Where does that come from? Well, we grow. We grow. There are some things that you couldn't do before that you can do now because you're no longer three years old. You give a three-year-old a car, they can't drive. You give a 16-year-old a car, you don't want them to drive. <laughs> things change. But there are people who come into their Christian life, they come in with a concept of, I can't, and they never allow the testing of their faith, the growing and the development of their experience with God. They set a limit of where they will go to in God, and then they accept that limit for the rest of their Christian journey. We do that all the time. 
We say, oh, I, I can't raise my hands in church. I, I, I can't pray for an hour. It's too long. Oh, I, 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 can't, I can't give to the church. I, I, I can't serve in children's church. Or, 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 we do all of these things all the time. But I wonder if we're saying can't when we really mean won't. We're saying I can't do it when what we actually don't want to say is I won't do it. Because the word won't has some preset limits connected to it. The word won't says that I have previously decided that that's where my ceiling is and I will not go beyond that ceiling. I have set a, a, a standard that I'm not prepared to go beyond. We do that all the time with church. We do it. We come to church and we're willing to listen to the message. We come to church and we're even excited to listen to the message. But we have already decided how far we will believe what the preacher preaches. I can get up here and preach a fiery, dynamic message and stir up all of those things. You will amen and you will cheer me on. You'll tap me on the shoulder on your way out and say what a good message that was. But you have already decided how much of that message will apply to you. Preset. How far is that going to take you? What is that going to look like for your Christian journey? What does that look like on your way forward? Oh, Nico, that's, that's just cruel. You can't say stuff like that. Get past your limitations. You've got to get past the things that you have decided, you have set. When we go to church with a preset limitation, we will only go as far as we have decided. So we have preset limitations in our faith. I can believe God for, for a swollen foot, but I can't believe God for raising the dead. Is it can't or won't? I can believe God for a headache, but I, I can't believe God that He would heal somebody of cancer. At what point did you set a ceiling to your faith? We do that in worship. I'll worship God in my way, but I won't worship Him any other way. Even if He stood right in front of me and told me to. That's just not the way we do stuff. Oh, really? Who set the limit? Who decided where the line is drawn, you or God? Oh, oh, but I'll worship God quietly. But David was undignified before the Lord and God was pleased with him. At what point do we decide where God draws the line? Friends. I'll be friends with the folks in the back, but these crazy bunch in the front, I don't want to be their friends. They're just crazy. I'll be friends with people my age, but I'm not going to mix with the young people because they, they're just out of my comfort zone. Setting limits. Making ceilings everywhere. Forgiveness. I can forgive that, but I cannot forgive that. That goes beyond my forgiveness. Ceilings. Limits. Giving. I can give my $2 to missions, but I won't support an India... Well, I won't support that because that's, I, I don't go there. Who said? Who, who made that limit? Serving. How many limits do we put in serving? I will serve communion, but I won't wash up. I'll help you eat the food, but I won't bring any. <laughs> Call me when it's ready. Who sets these limits? Who made it up? Where does it come from? Have you ever thought about the fact that there may be a lid on your Christian experience? Have you found you say, I'll never do that? Or you say, say to yourself, I, I always do it this way. I'm not going to do it any other way. Or my favorite one, that's not my call. That's not my gifting. Who said? Who drew this limit? At what point was there a limit here? What have you convinced yourself about your journey with God that has put a ceiling on how far you can go? 
As I was preparing this message, I was reflecting on, on about 30 years ago, more than that now, I put my hand up, I joined the Marines, I, I went to the armed forces, I wanted to be part of the Marines, and, and I got into my specialist training, and, and I was busy getting trained, and, and, and this sergeant, uh, sergeant uh, this uh, um, master at arms had such a, such a cruel nature about him, that when we were training, I thought I was going to die. I literally thought that I wasn't going to make it. There were parts of my being that was crying out, Lord, take me, take me now. And I wasn't even a believer then. <laughs> I thought I was going to die, but I didn't. I thought they were asking me to do stuff that was humanly impossible, but it wasn't. How did that happen? And one day God... 25 years ago, God calls me into ministry, and I'm thinking to myself, clearly he doesn't know who I am. Who told you that you can't do some things? What are your reasons, your excuses? And if somebody told you that you can't do something, or somebody said, oh, you, you're useless, you've got no place, or you're not able, why do you believe them? What is it that made you get to a place where you'll accept the word of somebody above the word of your heavenly Father who provided everything for you? At what point do we draw and say, hey, I believe God? Ceilings. The saddest part of that would be is if only you could see through God's eyes what potential, what amazing things may still be in your life and while you're protesting saying stuff like I can't do that that's too difficult for me it's much bigger than me you're saying God I will stay here I'm not going any further that's a sad sad place and I wonder this year as we look at our theme of advance and look at going deeper with God and, and seeing what God has for us this year you cannot do that unless you're willing to let go of those preset ceilings those preset limitations, because it's those things that hold your mind captive. Purpose never grows in comfort. Our purpose will never grow in comfort. Your blessings are always lying somewhere beyond your comfort zone. You've got to be willing to step out in God. You've got to be willing to say, God, I am willing to take one more step in you. But you see, for us, for the majority of believers, the problem we had is we insist on comfort. We insist on being comfortable. We want to be comfortable in every situation. And whatever we do, we want it to be easy and comfortable in how it comes across. And, and this comfort and comfortable and comfort and comfortable sets us in such a place that we never step out and walk in faith. If you follow my tweets, I tweeted this yesterday. Most people are not limited by their abilities. They're limited by their attitudes. Most people are not limited by their abilities, but by their attitudes, the way they see it. The man at the gate, beautiful. He just wanted a few dollars. Just give me a few dollars to get through the day. But Peter and John were there. The man at the pool of Bethesda, Please, can you just carry me a little bit closer to the water? But Jesus was there to heal. Man came to Jesus and said to him, what, what, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus told him, and he said, no, 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 that's beyond my comfort level. See, that's why we see so few miracles. People ask me all the time, why is it that when we go on mission trips, we see so many miracles happening, and then we can get back in, into our, our normal world, and we don't see those miracles? I'll tell you why. Because we have gotten so comfortable with limits. We are comfortable with our status quo. We, we're happy to sit and content to sit within the restrictions that we have allowed to exist in our Christian journey. Now, the next part's not going to be good for you. Because if you're saved, washed in the blood, and a follower of Jesus Christ, you should never be comfortable in church. Being comfortable in church is for those who come in broken and in need of comfort. 
when you're a believer washed in the blood, you are not meant to sit through every service and not get challenged. You're not meant to experience, oh, this is wonderful, go home, and nothing challenged me, nothing stirred me, nothing moved me. I I just loved it. It was so beautiful in church today. That, my friends, is not what our Christian journey should look like. If the church is doing that, and if that's your experience with church, and if that's what you're saying, then I'm doing a bad job, and so is the church, because every single message should be challenging you in your walk with God. If you're a born again, washed in the blood, follower of Jesus, your life should be challenged by the word. My job, my only job is to encourage you, to challenge you, and to employ you, to, to, to equip you for the work of ministry. You did hear the word work of ministry. There are places in our, our faith walk with God that is a walk of work. But we want to be comfortable. But your breakthrough doesn't come uncomfortable. If you would, you could. If you would trust God, you probably see much more happen in your Christian journey. Yeah, I, 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 was, I was studying this. Nicole was playing a message the other day, and I was sort of sneaking a, a listen to, to somebody else pre- preaching, and I thought, this will fit really nicely into my message. But here we find in in 2 Corinthians 8, we find the Macedonian church. The Macedonian church was in trouble. The the people in that area was in trouble. They were suffering. They were going through hardships. They they were in in a bad place. They were struggling. They were struggling so much that Paul felt sorry for them. Paul actually said, I don't, want to, I don't want to employ you in anything because I can see the difficulty that you're in. And so Paul was almost making an excuse saying, I'm willing to set you aside because I understand how tough life is for you. And the Macedonians said, don't you dare do that. Don't you dare disqualify us from what God's called us to. Don't you dare take out of our hands the opportunity to walk with God. And in verse 3, we find it says that according to their ability and, and, and beyond their ability, what happened was they, they thought they could only do this. And so they stepped out in what they could do as hard and as, as, as committed and as faithful as they could. But what happened was God took what they brought and multiplied it. God was able to take them to a place higher than they thought they could reach because they would. So they could. Where's your faith? Do you do things in your natural or do you do things in faith? Do you speak to people on the street? Uh, Do you speak to your neighbor? Do you speak to people in the natural or in your faith? Do you believe your finances in the natural or in, in your faith? At what point did you stop trusting God? These people show us that they would. And so they could. See, what happens, though, is we stop at a certain preset level. And that's where I've had enough. Reminds me of a widow in 2 Kings 4. She was in exactly the same kind of situation as the Macedonians. She was in trouble. She was suffering. Things were really, really bad. There was problems all around her. If she had to come in today and sit in one of these chairs, we would all say, you poor, poor girl, that is horrible. I can't believe that what you are going through. I can't believe the struggle and the troubles you're seeing. I, I can't believe how life has treated you, you poor thing. But God spoke to her and said to her, you get every vessel, every jar, every container you can find, and you bring it in. And God did a miracle that day and filled every single one of those containers. He has a thing that really struck me about these two stories. Is that if we believe God is unlimited, if we believe that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly all that we think, ask, or dream according to the power that works in us. Remember the two scriptures I had in the beginning? According to the power that works within us. Is it then possible 
that when we set a limit, when we say, God, I'm not going to bring any vessels, I'm not going to put any containers out, that we're stopping the flow from God. We're hindering the power of moving. In some way, we're, we're causing a struggle for miracles to get through to our lives. Who sets the limit? You or God? God is unlimited. And Jesus said, what's mine is yours. Who then decides what the limit is? Are you allowing God to set the limit? Or are you setting the limits for your Christian journey? Are you setting the limits for your faith? Because if you are, I want to challenge you today to break out of that. Because if the Macedonians had to believe the story that they were not able and they couldn't do it, they would today not be the breakthrough story that we have. If that widow had to say, I'm waiting for another word, I'm waiting for another prophet, because this prophet has said something I don't believe, what God would tell me to get a bunch of containers, what's this all about? They would have missed out on what God had for them. Who sets the ceiling? Who sets the limits? It's time to get out of the box. What box? There's a box. And if you have limits, you've set the size of that box. See, my Bible tells me that we are a new creation in Jesus Christ. My old creation is a box. My old creation had limits. In my old ways, in my own life, I could not do many things. But now in Christ, I can do all things. There's a difference here. My old man was stuck under the definitions of people who spoke things over my life and told me how bad I was and how horrible I was and and that I would never amount to anything and that I would be a criminal and all of these things. My old man was defined by other people. My new man is defined by Christ and by the Father's love. My old man listened to to my own voice in my ears, self-talking me into doubt and unbelief. My new man believes every promise that God has spoken. My old man was subject to dysfunctional families and dysfunctional history and generation after generation of junk. My new man is brand new. See, that's our problem. When we put ourselves in a box, we limit what God can do. So what most people do is they set the limit so low in their life. And then they say, where is God? But they set the limit so low and God was faithful. God worked within what they had expected by faith. And then they say, oh, I'm so disappointed. Where's God in my life? Why isn't God showing up? But you have set the limit here. God is faithful to the limit that you've set. Get out of the box. Get out of that limited thinking, that limited experience. You know what? As long as you stay in that box, you will never see more than ordinary suffering. That's why I don't like the old-fashioned psychology. Because old-fashioned psychology says the best you can get is ordinary suffering. I don't want any kind of suffering, never mind ordinary suffering. We are a new creation. What limits have you got in your life today? What limit have you got? What limit have you set to your faith? At what point do you stop believing? At what point do you say, God, I can't trust you that far? Could it be that some of the things today that you're unhappy and disappointed about in God could just be because your ceiling is over here? And if you would just break past that limitation, you would see God work according to your faith. 